Welcome to uh, European News Weekly. Uh, I have myself, Sean McGee, and Jimmy Hagen, uh, my co-host. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, welcome Timothy Mousseau, and he's uh, basically been doing studies in the Chernobyl and Fukushima uh, environments, uh, looking at the uh, effect uh, and uh, distribution of uh, contaminants uh, within the uh, sort of areas of the nuclear disasters. Um, so I'd like to welcome you. Uh, um, hi, uh, Tim. This is uh, great to have you on board. Well, thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I think we just had a little bit of a pre-talk there, and actually, I, 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 you picked up a point there, um, which I'm, I'm quite interested in. Now, you, you obviously have a hell of a lot of studies out. Um, you've been talking uh, on various uh, platforms about the situation. Uh, there's been uh, much discussion, uh, both from the pro uh, sort of nuclear, if I want to call them that, and the uh, the more activisty nuclear, anti-nuclear, um, and um, and all the shades in between. And we've been talking. Obviously, the, the the basic thing is is that you have discovered contaminants in in uh, sort of wildlife in these areas, and you've basically seen that there's uh, uh, sort of effects on the wildlife. So, and we were talking about this just before we started. So, and and the point that came up, uh, which I'm going to come straight to, actually, um, we were talking about uh, sort of. Uh, levels of contaminants or radio, radiological contaminants in these uh, species and uh, you, you kind of brought up a point that in Chernobyl uh, there was uh, strontium and, uh, and even plutonium uh, found in these animals in uh, maybe small amounts but, um, but certainly uh, they are there and I, what I'd like to know and I think other people out there would like to know is are these contaminants, have these contaminants been found in uh, Fukushima Prefecture, where the nuclear disaster was. Well, that's a yeah, you know, that's a really good question, and uh, you know, luckily, uh, if you can if you can say anything lucky about the disaster in Fukushima, it is that it, you know the contaminants were pretty much limited to large amounts of noble gases, krypton and xenon, which dissipated pretty quickly. Uh, you know, the iodine uh, that was released, that was, that was a huge problem initially, but it also dissipated relatively quickly. And really leaving just uh, isotopes of cesium, cesium-134 and cesium-137, uh, which are, you know, uh, they, they have a very long lifespan, but, you know, very long half-life of, you know, about 30 years, but they're not uh, potentially as toxic as some of the other isotopes that that that, that exist luckily uh, the plutonium releases were, were very 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 small I think there have been a few uh, samples um, where they've detected plutonium and and some isotopes of silver and, and perhaps a few other isotopes but most of those other isotopes are you know in very very small quantities relative to the cesium uh, that was released uh, that's very different to the the Chernobyl situation where huge quantities of strontium uh, about equal cesium and strontium in fact released uh, along with you know in several isotopes of plutonium uh, the plutonium is in the process of decaying into americium 241 right now and this americium is actually leading to uh, a relative increase in the radioactivity of the area, uh, at least in terms of, you know, the, 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 by virtue of the fact that the americium is, is particularly uh, radioactive, uh, more radioactive than the plutonium uh, parent. So, uh, yeah, the two situations in, in Japan and, and Chernobyl are quite different in a lot of ways. Uh, very, very fortunate for the people of Japan. It could have been much, much worse. Well, that's interesting. So, so what, 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 Basically, when we're sort of looking at the the isotopes, and the real isotopes to watch out for are the are the cesium one three four and cesium one three seven, and uh, what what about strontium uh, ninety or the uh, other strontium uh, isotopes? So in in Japan, uh, because the strontium is a is a metal at at, at, at lower temperatures, it, it it wasn't volatilized it, because the temperatures were relatively low uh, during the disaster. Uh, and it, it, so it wasn't volatile, volatilized to the same extent as the, the cesium and the iodine that, and, and the, the noble gases that, that were released. Uh, so it didn't go very far. Uh, of course, right now the problem is that the, you know, the groundwater and the cooling water that, that's being generated 
uh, at the plant, they are leaking into the ocean, and they they carry large quantities of strontium. Uh, and, sure. and so that that so the marine contaminant situation is completely different and, and potentially much more serious than than the terrestrial uh, contamination picture. Um, I, I I think this is probably outside your field, but certainly considering the marine uh, uh, sort of contamination, um, obviously people are sort of always worried about it making to its way to uh, the U.S. West Coast, but um, you know, if, if you look at the uh, the sort of the geology and the marine biology uh, off off the coast of Japan uh, for 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 quite some miles, you know, maybe a hundred miles or so, uh, there's a shelf and there's uh, many sort of uh, mounds and there's also uh, cracks in the ground and um, uh, many uh, fish species actually grow there, uh, you know, develop there. They're, they're, they're sort of a birthing place. Um, and uh, has anybody, do you know if anybody who's had to look at those areas, those very vital areas for the, the, the sustainability of the, of the uh, Japanese uh, fisheries, I should imagine? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And, you know, certainly there's been uh, a huge monitoring effort uh, to determine which of the species are most contaminated and, and several of the species, especially the species that live on the surface of the sediments. Uh, show very serious contamination levels, levels above what we would accept uh, for export from Japan, for instance, uh, for human consumption. And uh, and this this is a big problem. As far as I know, there's not uh, there's not been any real published research related to the impacts on the fish themselves. Uh, and you know that most of the work that's been done is is again surveillance work to, to determine whether or not the, the fish can be consumed uh, rather than the biological impacts uh, the potential genetic and evolutionary impacts sure. ecological impacts of, of of the contaminants on the fisheries itself I think that's a really important question and of course that's that's one of the the interests we have as a group okay so obviously you've got the sediment you as you go out to sea you've got a kind of a shelf and you've got sediment there and you've got fish there as well and various uh, fish that live on that as well, but but obviously there's like uh, nurseries, uh, nursery areas where there's like little hills, uh, you know, and especially in the deep sea uh, when you go off the shelf uh, of Japan. Um, uh, so basically, there's sort of like these little mounds and crevices, I was saying, and they're, they're the kind of nurseries. They they there's a lot of uh, fish species uh, and well, you know, the, the sea life that uh, that that inhabit these uh, sort of little islands. Um, in that area, so there's, you're saying there's been no no studies uh, in that deeper part of the ocean. You know, I, I you, yeah, you'd have to talk to some of the the folks that are involved in the surveillance efforts, but but as far as I know, there's been minimal uh, effort to study the biological impacts. Uh, again, most of the work has been focused on just determining whether or not the fish is uh, below regulatory limits for export. That, that team, that's the main you know, economic driver for the sure. interest. Uh, but the biological work has been almost nil as far as I can tell. Okay, and uh, well, well, let's let's get back onto the onto the land area. Uh, now, obviously, I, I suspect that you've been doing the slightly slightly more hotter areas. Um, which are go going northwest of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant uh, towards Fukushima City, um, that's, so that's going, and that's heading towards the mountains as well. Um, so, have uh, I mean, we'll come back to the, what you found there. I think because uh, obviously there's a lot of well documented stuff that you've put up, and uh, and and it's uh, quite quite uh, interesting uh, studies that you've done. Um, but going up into the mountains where. Uh, when the plume hit, it also um, contaminated it. Although it saved the mountains, saved the eastern part of, uh, sorry, the uh, yeah, sorry, the western part of Japan. Um, uh, the actual mountain itself had quite a big hit, and it, and it, from the water samples that we're getting now, it, it seems to be, from my my perspective, it seems to be that that some of that cesium that's up in those mountains that is starting to come down through, via the watercourses. What, has anybody done studies of wildlife up in those more remote places up in the mountains and certainly the east slope of uh, of Japan? Yeah, there, so you know, there's there's a, a little bit of research going on by folks in Japan, and, and of course, our team has been doing 
a fair bit of work on the birds and the rodents and the insects and some of the plants and even some of the microbial communities in the in the area. Uh, most of our work is, is indeed up in the, the mountainous side of Fukushima, sort of between Fukushima City itself and the coast, uh, up and down the mountains. Uh, we, we, we're actually looking at, you know, we're, the areas of highest contamination, uh, right, right, you know, in Namiya and the Hidate uh, regions. But we're also looking at similar ecological habitats that were much less impacted by the radiation so that we have sort of comparisons to draw upon so that we can look at how things look when it's relatively normal with respect to radiation compared to the impacts when uh, the radiation hits these environments. And yeah, over the last, you know, five years now, uh, we've published I, I, on the order of eight or nine, you know, data papers, primary papers, investigating the impacts on birds, insects, and uh, and and we're just starting to get the work uh, on rodents uh, out the door. Uh, you'll see a few publications this spring related to the impacts on the mice in the area, for instance. Uh, just this past year, we've also set up a bunch of cameras. Uh, to monitor the larger mammals in the area, the the, the wild boar, and then well, the most of the <laughs> most of the so-called wild boar are actually uh, domestic pigs crossed with wild boar. So there's a kind of a range of of, of pig-like critters uh, roaming through the zone at the moment. That's wild. Uh, <laughs> that's wild. It is wild. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's great. Uh, lots and lots of these pigs, and and lots of monkeys, and. Uh, and so we're starting to get a handle on what the impacts are on these larger animals as well in these very radioactive areas. Sure. And and uh, when you're saying that you, you're looking a little bit wider, um, I did a little article on uh, Oze, Oze Natural, National Park uh, just north of Chiba or, uh, well, on the edge of uh, the Fukushima prefecture, uh, south southern end. Yeah. It's a lovely uh, big wildlife park there. It goes up in stages. There's lots of watercourses uh, and wildlife. And um, uh, I discovered that, that it certainly got hit. So they, they were measuring on a Geiger counter 0.5 microsieverts uh, that I, I saw. Um, so there's obviously been some sort of hit there. Have, have you, and actually Tetco actually own it. I think they've got the larger share of it. And they, anyway, but um, so uh, have you checked that area out at all? Yeah, we, we certainly have. And, oh. and <laughs> you how, know, how we, did that go, dare I ask? Well, you know, it, it's. Um, it, it's uh, very, we were very disappointed uh, in, originally when we started doing our surveys because we'd, we'd hoped to be able to find some areas in Fukushima that, that were, you know, clean, that didn't have any contamination at all. And, and we were really unable to find any areas that hadn't been affected to some degree. Uh, by the contaminants, uh, but uh, but we did find areas like the region you mentioned that that has relatively lower levels, you know, less than 0.5 microsieverts per hour, which which uh, is you know relative to the 30, 40, 50 microsieverts per hour that we see up in the mountains where we're doing work. That's a you know that's a, a hundredfold less, and so that gives us sufficient range of radiation levels to do the sorts of experimental studies that we've been doing. But yeah, the it's very difficult to find a true control area in the region, uh, you know, an area that hasn't been affected at least to some degree by the radiation. Okay, so you've got 40 to 50 microsieverts an hour, uh, which uh, is uh, <laughs> quite a lot, um, up in the mountains, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, when you come down the mountains, you come onto Oze, Oze National Park, um, and uh, do you anticipate an increase in cesium in the lakes and the uh, in the wildlife around there in decades to come? Yeah, so so it's very clear there 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 actually is a fair bit of research being done by by geologists right now looking at sediment transport down through the streams down through the mountainsides. Uh, I think this is of particular interest given you know the massive disturbance that's been going on around Fukushima to you know remove the top layer of soil in these regions that they're hoping to entice people to move back to, and so uh, so there's a lot of, of sediment movement. Uh, 
via water, via the rain. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, we were there last October uh, sampling uh, mice, and uh, and we got hit by a typhoon, and, and there was about uh, 12 inches, 15 inches of rain that fell in in you know in 12 hours while we were there, <laughs> sort of washing out roads, and and you could see you know the the impact of the erosion of the of the land side of, of the landscape, uh, with you know all the movement of the sediments down through the rivers, and clearly that's going to be showing up in the lakes and the streams along the way, and 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 it's going to be having some impact far and wide and, and there is ongoing concern in fact uh, in the uh, you know the marine fisheries that you know the outflows from these rivers uh, where the sediments coming in that you know there's concern that these these fisheries will be continue to be impacted by this input of contaminants from the mountainsides for decades to come. I mean, uh, now you're talking about that we've got climate change, we've got hotter seas, we've got uh, uh, greater more persevering storms, um, so that we have to bear that in mind. Uh, and also, when we're looking at these this situation uh, in the mountain, uh, this uh, you know these these forty and fifty microsieverts uh, uh, per hour sort of um, uh, sort of measurements that you're getting, which is obviously a hell of a lot of becquerels in soil. Um, <laughs> you're saying that basically it's getting swept down, and obviously Jose National Park is is a layer of plateaus uh, with with lakes on. And and one would imagine that the uh, the heavier sediment as it comes down will settle in these lakes. And has there been any studies done uh, to get a sort of a, a basic me measurement in the um, uh, in these sediments and also um, in the uh, wildlife, the uh, insects that that actually live uh, in the soil or on the shoreline of the, the of these lakes and rivers. Yeah, I, I don't know of any specific studies uh, going on. Uh, I was I was actually uh, in Fukushima last September as well, and and there was a conference in in, in Fukushima City, uh, where they had uh, quite a large number of, of geologists from around the world uh, who descended upon Fukushima to to draft up a plan to conduct research of of the sort you're describing. I'm presuming that we'll start to see the results of these kinds of studies uh, in the next year or two. Uh, as, are, as the are they independent studies like yourself? You're an independent uh, uh, from uh, the uh, nuclear, you're an academic. So uh, are these academics or, or uh, do you think these may be academics that maybe get funding from the nuclear in industry? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't, actually, I, I don't think a lot of academics get funding from the nuclear industry. For some reason, they don't want to fund us. Uh, I'm not sure why. But uh, <laughs> no, I can tell you why. No, <laughs> no, you won't. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been hoping for a big grant from a nuclear uh, source uh, for years, but it's it's never come. But well, anyway, I, I, what I hear is that the nuclear industry is going down the pan, certainly in the UK um, and uh, France. So um, so may, maybe maybe when 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 that happens, maybe they'll. Uh, they'll uh, need to put some funding into something else other than uh, whatever they're putting it into at the moment. Yeah, you know, the, the, the folks that I ran into in the hotel where I was staying actually were, were independent scientists from Canada and the US and you know academic scientists and they were I think they were largely self-funded at that point but I think they were hoping to uh, put grant proposals together and to, uh, to fund some uh, unsolicited research. Uh, clearly needs to be done and the more people who get involved the better. Um, do the Japanese fund any of this research? You, you know, they're they're funding uh, various groups to certain uh, to certain extents. Again, uh, most of the funding uh, that that that's going to Fukushima is related to the surveillance operation to 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 ensure or to measure the you know levels of contamination in in foodstuffs uh, and uh, also some of the the medical. Uh, surveillance that's being done, especially related to you know thyroid cancers and, and that kind of thing. Not a lot, not a whole lot of research for independent uh, funding for independent scientists at other academic institutions. Uh, that's just not. There hasn't been any special calls for you know Fukushima research, and and so there's really just a handful of, of independent scientists who've managed to uh, find their way into uh, into this region to do uh, independent research. Uh, you know the, the the big issue with most academic scientists is that you know they they just don't have the resources to do it unless there's a grant, and and uh, and so if there's no grant, then it just doesn't get done.
And of course, you're, you're basically going over there and then you go to Chernobyl and then you go and you have to do your papers and then you have to fight, I suppose, with the peer review process. Uh, um, uh, how does the peer review process, uh, do you find that you're, uh, you really get, uh, I mean, for instance, Ian Fairley uh, spent two years trying to get a paper out because it was saying that uh, uh, nuclear power stations cause leukemia in children. Um, so uh, do, do you find a, a similar uh, issue? You know, it, it, it's always a, a constant battle, and, and, and I, you know, I suppose that's, that's the, really, uh, the real positive aspect of the peer review process is that, it, you know, it, it's not easy to, to publish uh, uh, anything uh, in any field. <laughs> it, yeah. it's, a, it's a real battle all the time, and, and that's part of the process, and that's what keeps us all honest uh, to some extent. But yeah, the, the downside is that occasionally there are, uh, you know, especially something that's at the edge, on the edge, or, or in a field that there aren't a lot of people working in, it's often very difficult to find reviewers who are sufficiently knowledgeable and sufficiently open-minded uh, to consider uh, these more creative kinds of studies. Uh, this has been a, an issue for the last couple of decades as we, you know, move towards these multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary kinds of, of, of studies, and, and it's just a, a challenge getting uh, qualified people to do the reviews. Uh, but yeah, it, it, you know, it, we, you know, certainly we, with great effort <laughs> and perseverance, you know, we have managed to to publish most of our our studies uh, without. At least eventually, uh, you know, we've published about 80 papers in the last 10 years or so, and so you know that's certainly testimony to the fact that it can be done, sure, uh, sure. but it is a lot of work. Yeah, no, and, and, and thank you for doing it. Um, uh, now, I uh, consider it. We'll stick with the peer review process here for a minute. Um, now, I, I, I was, I was on the. I was. I'm a, I do blogging, so uh, as well, and I, I'm a bit of a, a an anti-nuclear troll. I put my hands up, and <laughs> Uh, so what I did, I was having a chat with some pro-nuclear types um, concerning Professor Tsuda, um, who brought out a thyroid study, and uh, and of course I was saying, well, you know, that study's really good. He's but he's the only guy that counted it up, and he actually went to the bother of doing it. And anyway, they're all connected with the uh, uh, what, I, what I call the uh, um, Yahoo um, sort of Pentagon uh, nuclear uh, sort of health physicists. There's about uh, I think there's about twenty to forty of them. It's hard to say because uh, they, they they have lots of different names anyway. Um, and I was having a chat with uh, one of them, and he goes, "Oh no, and it's all wrong, and this and this and this." And he gave me a list of about six points why uh, Professor Suda was wrong, and. Um, so I, what I did, I, he, he then challenged me to contact Professor Suda and ask him, he said. And so I, I did. I thought, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to do this. And I sent the questions to Professor Suda on a Friday, and on a Sunday, I got them back. So God bless him. Uh, all the answers, I put those onto a blog, and then I went back to Japan Times, uh, gave him a little heads up, said, I've done, this, done the study, and I would say they gave it about 24 hours and they came back with another list of about eight questions. Now, my point being is that if they had those eight questions already, plus the six they gave me, why didn't they give me all 14 to start off with? Um, so the point being here is that in the peer review process, you know, they could turn around, they could say, look, here's our argument, here's your argument. But what they don't do that, what happens is you give your argument and they knock a few bits off. And you spend time, you do your thing, and then send it off, and you wait around, and then they bring it back, and then they ask you some more. And then you, the whole process, is, and it takes years. So this is what happened to Ian Fairley. They didn't lay all their cards on the table. They held some back to delay the peer review process. Now, has, has anything like that happened to you? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I frankly think you're giving these folks way too much credit and, and for foresight. For the, uh, you know, I, I don't think it, it. You know, I don't really think it works exactly that way. Uh, I don't think they're it, that. It, it only you took know. 24 hours of them to come up with another eight. So, but, but anyway, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll it, move know, on. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just sort of you know it, it's. It's an imperfect process, uh, and it's just better than the alternative, and uh, nobody's come up with a better no, alternative. I totally agree. I, I just, I just think uh, it, it's a shame that it can. It sometimes delayed and made much more difficult. Uh, oh. 
if, if you if they wanted to in the strategy in terms of strategy playing chess or whatever no i i agree with that yeah. certainly and, and it certainly right. slowed us down greatly from time to time and it's frustrating as heck and uh but yeah it's just it it, it really is the the best uh that we have the best model we have for moving knowledge forward at this point no. uh and uh and so yeah we just you just have to live with it to some extent but now if these people are really truly being disingenuous disingenuous and dishonest uh, then, then that's something else, you know. I think that that's a different issue. And if there's a way to, to uh, to reveal that, uh, then uh, that that's worth pursuing, uh, you know. I, I certainly will. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, all right. So, so we've I think we've covered the peer review thing, and we've uh, uh, just given people something to think about. Maybe um, coming on to funding. Going back to funding. Sorry. Mm. Um, now. Uh, Obviously, you have pro well, you obviously do get some funding, thank heavens. Um, but um, uh, when we're talking about doing studies on the ground in Fukushima, um, is there problems? Uh, so, say for instance, Ken Busler, uh, he basically said, "Right, we're going to check the water. We're going to see if it's contaminated. We're going to, you know, uh, we're going to measure it." And he put a crowdsource out, and he also asked people to actually participate in this. Um, so he got money. And not only that, but he got on the ground workers who could take samples. So when we take that, if we were to take that uh, sort of, uh, what we call it, um, that, that format, and we were to put that into to Japan, and we were to sort of look at the fact that because of the secrets law that came in, that, you know, if people talk about Fukushima, they could go to prison. It's only a threat, but it's on the books. There is a secrets law. Um, I don't know if they've hit anybody with it, but uh, but it puts a lot of fear into people. And I, I personally know that uh, Japanese in UK have been harassed and uh, attacked uh, for their anti-nuclear activities. Um, I could guess that that is definitely happening in Japan. Uh, there is a sort of kind of suppression. Uh, even if you don't apply the law, it still it still uh, stops you uh, doing having your free speech basically. So, with that in mind, you know, if you were to set up something similar in Japan, uh, in fact, could you set up something similar like that in Japan, given the situation? Are the people you know there? Could they do the samples? Could they go around taking little samples of soil or catching some flies or bugs or uh, four-legged four critters or whatever it is? Um, it, it, well, I'll just I'll leave the door open to you to have a wee talk about that that kind of thing. Yeah, no, uh, really good question, and and you know, you know, want to start by saying that Insler has done a you know a, a fabulous job at raising public awareness and and getting citizen scientists involved in the process, but the you know the funds that he's raised come nowhere near the cost of doing the science. They 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 barely pay for the shipping and and, and processing of the samples, and so this really is just a you know, a, a really uh, a very limited effort. It doesn't in any way uh, provide the level of information that we really need to to address the bigger question. Uh, but that said, he's doing a fabulous job uh, with the, with what he's got at hand to do it. <laughs> yeah, totally. in, you know, in 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 Fukushima and in Chernobyl, uh, one of the one of the problems, uh, the the real difficulty with with enlisting citizen scientists to to get involved, is that well, first of all, it's kind of a dangerous place. Uh, you don't really want, you know, the, the middle schoolers out there collecting dirt from these radioactive areas, do you? Uh, and so, you know, it's not something that you can really enlist, uh, you know, the lay public to get involved in because of the hazards associated with it. The other aspect is, of course, there's a big fence around this area and, and it, it actually uh, is, is a rather involved and difficult process to gain permission to, to do work in these areas. Uh, both Chernobyl and Fukushima have a very long involved uh, permit process that uh, really make it, uh, you know, only uh, an option for folks who are, who are engaged in some level of serious activity. So, so the citizen scientist uh, component of this really is not available for that kind of of, of research activity that certainly the kind that we're doing anyway in these in these areas of high contamination uh, you know in terms of the you know the the secrets law uh, you know I think I believe this this really only prov 
it really only applies to journalists. I don't think it applies to you know common citizens doing their their day to day thing. But but that said, I, you know I do think there is an awful lot of uh, what I would call self censorship going on in Japan, uh, in that people are you know being quite restrained in in, in their in their comments and 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 concerns and and not getting involved in any kind of protest for the most part and and, and it is a very conservative society uh, by and large. But that said, you know uh, we've been working there for five years, and uh, this past year, you know we've been invited. Uh, to stay uh, and live with people who have homes in the region uh, so that we could be, you know, staying close up to where our field sites are. People have volunteered to cook for us and, <laughs> and to help us with translation and interpretation. Uh, we People who have homes, who still have homes inside these most radioactive areas have volunteered their their, their farmhouses and, and barns uh, for us to do our work in. And, and so, you know, that level of citizen uh, participation is certainly uh, very important for our work. Uh, and, and of course, we've also had quite a number of, of donations from individual Japanese uh, citizens who, who, who've been supportive of our research uh, in, in, in many different ways, including financially. Again, it's just a spit in the bucket in terms of the costs. Uh, and, and I certainly could could share with you a lot of uh, creative ways <laughs> that we've gotten the funding, but I did want to I did want to uh, address the issue you bring up the the censorship issue, and you know one of one of my current theses is that uh, there's there's a there's a sort of an insidious form of censorship going on that most people aren't aware of they're not really tuned into it and that's the fact that if you don't fund science, if you don't provide resources for research to get done, it doesn't get done. And as a consequence, questions are not asked, they're certainly not answered. Uh, most scientists are, uh, you know, truly uh, uh, craftsmen and they uh, employ their skills to, to address these, these, these scientific questions, uh, but they um, they can't do it unless they get paid, unless they pay their salaries, unless they can pay for the, the salaries of the people who work for them, unless they can pay for the, the lab materials and supplies. And so it's a very large enterprise. And this is one of the reasons that, for instance, in the United, in the United States, the National Science Foundation has a budget of uh, you know, something approaching eight or nine billion dollars a year. Uh, the National Institutes of Health research budget is, you know, tens of billions of years a year. Uh, research is expensive, and 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 so if you don't fund it, this really does uh, limit the knowledge that can be gained on a given topic. So, uh, what do you reckon on uh, crowdsourcing? Um, is what's the, the possibilities of marketing for crowdsourcing? Uh, have you tried it? Is it difficult? Uh, what results if you have? You know, you know, I, you know, I haven't. I haven't, you know, tried the sort of conventional crowdsourcing approach. It's, um, it, 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 it the, the main issue is that it, as far as I can tell, uh, based on uh, my colleagues uh, who've tried it, it doesn't provide enough funding to, to get the job done. And, you know, the, the, the operation that I'm running in Chernobyl and Fukushima, you know, costs on the order of several hundred thousand dollars a year to maintain. And so, uh, you know, the only sources of funding that can provide that level of investment are really government sources or institutional sources. Uh, and, uh, and, but, you know, th that said, you know, I haven't had much luck <laughs> with some of the other more conventional sources. So maybe, maybe I'll try the crowdsourcing route and, and see how it goes. If you have any tips, let me know. Well, uh, you know, obviously, we're, 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 you know, it's at the moment in terms of blogging, we're, uh, you know, it's, but we find it very hard. Like on Facebook, uh, we get blocked and sidetracked. Google and YouTube, we, you know, um, YouTube hasn't been too bad actually, but but certainly, in uh, we've we've noticed that uh, with Google searches and things, uh, sometimes those are very difficult if you if you're kind of a, an activist and uh, a non-payer. Same in Facebook, if you're not paying for. Uh, adverts, you know, uh, you, you don't get those uh, boosts of numbers. You know, you get into, you get put into a, um, a very, you know, the, the 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 amount of posts you put up, you get small amounts. But having said that, though, the combined all the different social media, um, it is possible. I, sh I should imagine to try and raise some money. Uh, 
but um, but I, I would recommend it because I'm sure you know if you got some that would be that would be some um, and yeah. uh, you know maybe if people had a had the option to to uh, pay for your you know pay, help pay for your research but uh, just to, for the sake of opening a PayPal account and having a fundraiser account uh, uh, and then basically uh, you know every time you bring out uh, a sort of a paper uh, you um, you know do a radio show or you know you just say look we, we've got fundraising and, and publicize it um, we can only hope that the media will sometimes pick up on these things uh, but uh, they, they tend to pick up more on the negative aspects um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's it's it, it, you know, it's it's a difficult one, but I think it's certainly certainly worth a try. Um, I, I know that your your work is, uh, in my opinion, is is incredibly important because we we will definitely not get the uh, money for studies for human beings, uh, and I think uh, Professor Suda would agree. Um, so uh, it would be you know, and in fact, actually, in Japan, you you were saying that uh, that. Uh, you know, censorship only applies to journalists, but it also applies to health workers as well. Um, because um, from my point of view, there was polydactyl, from my point of view, uh, there was nosebleeds and all sorts of things um, uh, from from the on-the-ground people that I was talking to. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know about cancers or anything else, but, but, but certainly before any of those effects became apparent, um, and uh, the polydactyl was just becoming apparent, uh, they, they closed it down. And, in, and there was also a blood test uh, that you could do within three years, and it could tell if you had some damage due to radiation. But after three years, uh, it was useless. And two and a half years in, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, turned around and said that so he wouldn't do it because it might find, uh, the, they might find illegitimate children. Um, he needed to have a discussion about it, and there was only six months left for the uh, the test to be viable. So th there's all that kind of stuff going on, especially with the health effects, and also the secrecy law does apply to that. However, you know you're studying uh, wildlife, and it seems, thank heavens, that that your work is is uh, being allowed. And you know we we can't. Uh, I think you've said yourself you can't tie the health effects to the. Uh, to the to the other effects, the human effects. So, but uh, but certainly the rest of us can. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> did I say that? Whoops. Um, but yeah, no. It's it, we we can sometimes draw comparisons. Um, okay. So I mean, we could pop over to Chernobyl. Um, I think um, mm. at this point, um, and or pop back there. Um, we were obviously sort of uh, looking at. Well, basically, you've done a study recently and um, it, it's going to be you're going to you've obviously going to be drawing this paper up and getting ready for the battle in the peer review sector uh, would you would you like to tell us um, some of the findings and it's quite quite dramatic I was uh, quite uh, impressed with the with what you were saying uh, but um, would you like to tell us uh, about that uh, upcoming paper uh, yeah sure yeah you know we, we, we've uh, we, we keep a uh, a steady, a steady uh, <laughs> movement forward. Uh, you know, actually, just last week we published a paper. I'll mention that one first. Uh, it was one of our. It's one of our first studies on the mice, or the rodents of of, of Chernobyl, uh, where we have been monitoring their survival, success, and diseases uh, in the, the the Chernobyl zone in both clean areas and in highly radioactive areas. And this first paper documents very clearly increased rates of cataracts in the eyes of these mice which is of course you know one of the the eye is one of the more sensitive tissues to to radiation and tends to show the effects of radiation soonest uh, and we previously documented cataracts in the eyes of the birds uh, of the region a couple of years ago so this was an interesting finding uh, uh, that that's sort of supported our ongoing uh, studies of the of the region but yeah we have another paper that that's already gone through the review process so I, I can I can tell you that it will be coming out in trends in ecology and evolution uh, it's basically uh, uh, an analysis of, of all of the studies including ours but but many other people's studies uh, that have attempted to determine whether or not plants and animals and bacteria are actually adapting, you know, evolving to deal with the radiation in, in the Chernobyl region in the face of these radioactive contaminants. You know, there are a lot of reasons to believe that 
that plants and animals and microbes should be able to adapt to increased levels of radiation. You know, in the past, there's been higher levels of radiation on the surface of the planet. In fact, you know, terrestrial life as we know it didn't evolve until about, I think, 500 million years ago when the UV levels actually finally dropped below, you know, really seriously dangerous levels. And so, uh, you know, in the past, the organisms have had to deal with higher radiation levels. So why not? Why shouldn't they evolve now in the face of nuclear disasters? Well, the, in, the, the, short, the short story is that we could find no evidence, no significant evidence that plants and animals uh, have in any way been able to, you know, address this increased level of radiation in any adaptive way. There's, there doesn't seem to be any positive evolution response to the radiation. All of the effects pretty much seem to be negative. And, and this really wasn't that surprising to us uh, because, you know, biologically it's just not, um, you know, animals and plants, organisms are constantly facing mutations and just as a result of day-to-day -day life and they're, they're trying to deal with these mutations as best they can. Radiation comes along and just contributes an additional mutational load that has to be repaired or, or dealt with in some way. Uh, and so it's not really surprising to us that, that there really is no way to 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 be better at it, uh, at least not without some other cost. So that's the that's the basic finding. It, it'll be out in probably about a month from now. I'll, I'll certainly send you a link to it when it comes out. Fantastic, and I'll definitely do an article and spread it round. Um, <laughs> now, uh, while we're talking about this, and we, we, um, I did a, an article a while ago, uh, which you uh, generously, you know, is to do with Science Daily, talking about the fact that uh, how how wonderful it was that uh, animals were adapting and um, uh, so on and so on. And of course, when I sent you that article, you you sent it back. Um, so basically, uh, you, you sent a reply back, and I did. A you know, we, we we sort of kind of clarified this point. You know that, uh, and I think you said that uh, although some uh, sort of species seem to be uh, sort of doing well, I think it was particularly black uh, birds or, or birds with uh, black pigment. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, in this study, does 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 the uh, is there any change to that 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 aspect? I know I know you also said there was a complete disaster with the rest of the wildlife, but but with this particular issue uh, that Science Daily picked up on. Um, uh, do you kind of stand by that? Is that, is that still still a, a situation that that uh, that sort of? Adds? Yeah, yeah. No, no. It it, it does. And, and and so the basic finding from that study was that so the the organisms can you know either use these antioxidants to reduce the mutational load or they can use it to uh, advertise uh, to a mate or defend against some other disease. But there's this ultimate trade off that that limits their their success in one way or another. And that's really the, the main story. Sure, sure. So in terms of the uh, evolution of these uh, these uh, birds, um, it, it would be the case that, uh, you know, given climate change as well and uh, and their general evolution anyway, uh, that, that the evolutionary process in these birds may, may be uh, may be stopped, you know, so they, they, they can't change their, their pigment in their color because of the antioxidants. Um, so, uh, but, I mean, basically, how, how does how's that, how does that pan out? How do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, that, that's certainly one one possibility. Uh, you know, given that some of these pigments are used for thermal regulation, and, you know, to to conserve heat or to absorb heat, uh, it, that, that's certainly one hypothesis that could be tested, and it, and it seems likely that 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 might be involved for for at least some of these organisms. But that, you know, that's sort of one of the common, one of the basic rules of, of evolutionary biology is that there are always trade-offs. <laughs> you know, you, you know, if we, if, if we could do better universally, uh, we probably would be doing better. Uh, you know, evolution has tested most of the permutations that, that exist, uh, and, and found the ones that seem to work best under most circumstances. But there's always a, a reassortment and, and change as, as the environment changes as well. Sure. And um, the other thing I was going to bring up was, uh, you know, obviously I, I've, I've been uh, annoying the nuclear industry for some time now. And one of the annoying things I did was uh, contact uh, Geraldine Thomas uh, because I was uh, uh, looking at uh, Chernobyl Children International and their claim that uh, 
that um, there's an effect, and it's on the uh, on their on their uh, charity status, the, the, their statement of uh, of a fact that Chernobyl, the radiation from Chernobyl, is causing problems in the hearts of young children, um, and and this pinholes specifically. Um, so, uh, have you come across any findings where? Possibly there's been uh, pinholes uh, or in the heart, or if there's been effects uh, in that area. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. You know, I think it's pretty well recognized that there is a broad array of cardiovascular issues associated with radiation exposure. I think there have been quite a number of studies in Ukraine and Belarus uh, that have, have made that you know identified that association, not just in children but in adults as well, especially you know the liquidators that got large doses. And so you know that kind of research is worth pursuing, and, and we haven't looked yet at 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 the mice for that particular kind of uh, effect and but I think you know given what you just said I think we'll probably make it a priority to go back through our samples and see what we can find that seems to be a good thing to look for that's fantastic right so um, well I'd, I'd just like to maybe we could sort of kind of finish up here I suppose because it's been quite long it's been absolutely amazing uh, information you've, you've given and uh, and it's been well delivered thank you so much for that uh, but just to finish well, off uh, is there anything well, before uh, we finish up Sean hmm? right can, can I just ask one or two questions by all means crack away <laughs> yeah yeah thanks but thanks buddy now at the beginning of your interview, uh, Timothy, you, we were talking about Chernobyl and we were talking about Fukushima. And uh, you kind of sort of hinted at the fact that Chernobyl was so much more worse than Fukushima. W w would, would you give us a little bit of an idea as to, uh, as to why that, 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 that comes about? Yeah, well, you know, again, it, 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 I, I, let me let me qualify that by saying I'm speaking just about the effects on terrestrial systems, and 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 largely, of course, on on the people that that were exposed. You know, the Chernobyl disaster released again enormous quantities of radionuclides across Europe, uh, Eastern and Western Europe, and Scandinavia, uh, affecting many, many, many many more people than were directly impacted in Japan. And so at that scale, uh, you know, the terrestrial scale, uh, the Chernobyl disaster was was much larger. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about the impacts to the marine environment where there's an ongoing and, and of course, uh, ongoing disaster and, and, and where most of the radionuclides from Fukushima ended up. And, and, and we really have uh, just a minimal idea of what the potential impacts will be in the long run from the marine side. But from a terrestrial point of view and from a human point of view, uh, the impacts of the Fukushima disaster are, are, were considerably lower, not just because of the amounts, but also because it was limited to a, a much smaller range of, of radionuclides, uh, radionuclides that are generally considered to be a little less dangerous uh, in terms of their, their toxicity. Um, and, and so the, the other, you know, the other aspect, uh, we actually wrote a paper last year, uh, the group published a paper last year showing that, you know, if the Fukushima disaster had occurred at any other time of the year, uh, in 2011, the impacts on the terrestrial side would have been much, much larger. You know, Tokyo would have been, uh, basically doused with radioactivity. Uh, many more millions of people would have been doused with, with, with significant amounts of contamination. It was just, Again, just incredibly fortuitous that, that it occurred in March and that the wind was blowing most out to sea, at least in terms of the people of Japan. Um, so that's, that's what I was getting at when I was saying that. I'd like to qualify that as well, if I might. Um, I did some study on the meteorological effects around Japan, and I think about once or twice a year, uh, the winds, uh, the polar winds come down. And they actually push, um, they actually push all the, uh, um, sort of the winds come from the north and it actually pushes it even beyond the, uh, the equator. So it actually breaks the equator it, it, and, uh, it, you know, it would have ended up going directly to Australia basically. Um, <laughs> and, and certainly straight across uh, Tokyo. And obviously the prime minister can, uh, uh, basically said that, uh, you know, Tokyo got off, uh, uh, lightly, although we've obviously discussed the fact that radiation got there and it got there with uh, in, in various plumes in, uh, during that time. There was a couple of vector paths, 
Um, but but as you were saying, it was uh, we, we had a, a strong uh, kind of uh, east uh, westerly wind coming in. Um, but okay, sorry, Jimmy, uh, you were going to ask another question. Yeah, I've just got one more now, and <laughs> it, it actually concerns the removal of topsoil, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, because um, because for example, I'm I, I'm really into uh, gardening and I'm into horticulture and stuff like that, and to me. The idea of removing topsoil doesn't seem to be a solution as such because when you remove the topsoil, um, no matter how radioactive or it, re radioactively it's contaminated, like you're, you're removing the basis for all future um, life in the soil because, like, the subsoil itself doesn't really support much life. So, any, any thoughts on that, Timothy? Yeah, no, of course you're right. And, uh, the, the only real comment is that, you know, they're, they're only doing this for about a 20 foot section on either sides of the roads and around the homes. So, so they're really only carting off a very small amount of the soil, uh, the soil that, you know, would lead to radiate high rail radiation measurements on the roadsides as people are passing. And, and so it's really kind of a superficial cleanup in that regard. And, uh, and so, um, you know, and, and of course, because the plants, you know, are, uh, transpiring, you know, they're bringing water up from the soil through, through their roots up to the leaves and the leaves, uh, you know, concentrate the cesium and the leaves then drop to the ground every fall or different times of the year, depending on the species. They're going, you know, there's going to be a, a rebuild, a regrowth of the soil along with the contaminants in that soil. So it's not going to disappear for all that long, uh, especially given that, uh, you know, these roads, sides tend to be in the valleys. And, and so there's going to be constant movement of, of the sediment and the contaminants along with the water down towards these lower areas from the mountainsides. So, so. You know, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's there's an issue with removing the topsoil, but um, but it you know in the end it's 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 a really superficial uh, attempt to uh, to provide this appearance of reduced contamination, but it's really not the solution to the problem in the area. Well, that's actually quite interesting. I'd, I'd just like to step take a, another step onto that, just a very quick one, if I might. Um, the Obviously, they take the, stop to, uh, uh, the top soil away, and they have got absolutely masses of it, even though there's only taking a small uh, percentage of it. Um, and uh, what, what happens with the uh, leaves? They, they drop, and uh, are they biodegrading? Uh, are you having any similar situations that you found in Chernobyl where, where things are not biodegrading, um, and in which case they're just going to sort of be blown around and end back up on top of whatever, whatever surface uh, is there? Uh, you, have you got any sort of a take on that? Yeah, it, it's a good question. You know, we 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 actually just finished that experiment. We we went and redid that that same experiment that we'd done in Chernobyl. Uh, we repeated it in Fukushima, and we're just in the process of getting the data analyzed at this point. The, we put out leaves, uh, rotting. You know, we put out dead vegetative matter all around the zone and areas of high contamination, areas of low contamination, different species of, of plant material, and left it there for a year and recovered them uh, just a few months ago. And now they've been dried and, and weighed, and now we're starting to analyze to see if, in fact, the microbial activity that would normally you know, decompose this plant material and recycle the nutrients, uh, to see if it's been affected the, to the same, in the same way that, that it had been, uh, in Chernobyl. We're not, we're not entirely sure. You know, first of all, the levels of, of radioactivity are, are, uh, you know, quite a bit lower in Fukushima in general. And so there, there might be, uh, reduced effect. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, there are, you know, there's a different, uh, a much simpler array of radionuclides in the soil. It's really just cesium-134 and cesium-137 rather than uh, the other uh, isotopes that you can find in Chernobyl that may be important to in, in, in affecting the microbial community. We, again, we just don't know. Uh, so hey, call me back in a few months and I, I should have an answer for you. We certainly will. <laughs> and and on that note, um, and is there anything else, Jimmy, you'd like to say? Uh, no, do you know no. what? I, I couldn't add anything to that. Like, I was so nervous, right? 
coming into this interview because I so I knew so little about Timothy's work, but I, I actually feel like I've come out and I've learned something. So um, I'm go I'm going to leave my question at that. And uh, thanks, Timothy, very very much. Well, thanks for thanks for calling me up. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you guys. No, oh, great stuff, mate. And um, yeah, we'll definitely uh, we'll definitely be in contact with you again. And uh, you know, uh, this is going to be a fantastic uh, podcast. I'll spread it everywhere. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. God, God bless, and uh, and thank you so much for joining us on uh, European News Weekly. Pleasure.